I'm not sure that they're in place yet. Oh, there we go. Good morning, Director Carroll. Good morning. I was just morning, saying, uh, we are live, Senator. Okay, thank you, Steve. Can you see and, and hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks for your help with this. Uh, and thanks to uh, all of our participants. I'm really grateful for your time and interest and all the work that you do on this very important issue. Uh, 2020 has undoubtedly been an extraordinary year from an impeachment to a pandemic to a lockdown, civil unrest, and a contentious election. Uh, and yet it remains the case that the topic about which I've had the most meetings and discussions since I joined the Senate has been the opioid epidemic and the drug addiction that uh, is related to it. This is a scourge that continues to impact our entire Commonwealth, does not discriminate based on age, race, social standing, or geography, and it's been devastating. Now, I think it's also true that there's been some progress in recent years after nearly two decades of annual increases, the rate of overdose deaths in America declined between 2017 and 2018 by about 4% nationally. And Pennsylvania saw a more dramatic decline in 2018. Uh, there was about an 18% decrease in overdose deaths compared to 2017's peak. Uh, we've seen corresponding uh, decreases in total opioid prescriptions being written. We've seen increases in the use of uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. We've seen increases in naloxone prescriptions. So we have made some progress. I think the progress uh, can be attributed to a number of factors. There's been some legislation that I think has been constructive. There's definitely been a dramatic increase in public awareness about the nature of this problem. And there's been an increase in physicians' awareness about the dangers of prescribing opioids. I think all of these have been contributing factors. On the legislative front, uh, CARA was the legislation that um, I think had a significant impact. It's the, that's an acronym for the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the Support Act, uh, Support for Patients and Community, Act. Together, these two bills really updated federal health care programs to reduce overprescribing of opioids and authorized hundreds of billions of dollars to improve access to treatment and other services. Uh, it also, the, 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 these bills also took some modest steps to keep illegal fentanyl out of our country or at least diminish its presence in our country. But there's no doubt that this job is not even close to being finished. Um, there's, there are a number of issues that need to be carefully monitored, two of which uh, are, uh, I will touch on. One is synthetic opioids, and the other is the um, unintended adverse consequences uh, with respect to opioid addiction and overdoses that result from the COVID-19 lockdown. So on the topic of the synthetic opioids, um, synthetic Opioids, specifically fentanyl, have added an unprecedented lethality <clears throat> to the opioid crisis simply because they're so massively powerful, 30 to 50 times more powerful than heroin. Just two milligrams of fentanyl, just the equivalent of a few grains of salt, is enough to kill most people. 80% uh, of all overdoses involve one or more opioids and illicit fentanyl is involved in about three out of four opioid overdose deaths. In Pennsylvania, 70% of the 4,500 opioid deaths that occurred in 2018 involved fentanyl. And nationally, um, it's caused roughly 45% of the 67,000 opioid deaths in 2018. Um, another way to illustrate the uh, the danger uh, that's posed by fentanyl in June of 2018, the Customs and Border Patrol seized 110 pounds of fentanyl at the Port of Philadelphia. So 110 pounds is not a massive uh, quantity of something. I mean, it's the size of a, a good sized dog. Um, but that amount of fentanyl was enough to kill every man, woman and child in Pennsylvania twice. 
It's staggering how lethal this stuff is. It's part of the reason why I've been on a multi-year campaign to get the Blocking Deadly Fentanyl Imports Act signed into law. This is bipartisan legislation. And what it would do is suspend certain categories of foreign aid to countries that are not doing as much as they can and should be doing to cooperate with us in preventing fentanyl from uh, going from their country to ours. This legislation has passed. Uh, this year it is in the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, it was not in the House version, but it is possible that it will be in the conference report, the final version, and that is, that is very much my hope. Um, I think it's also important that we acknowledge that the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns have had adverse consequences, um, and specifically for, for our health, for social and workplace interactions, as well as the obvious implications for our economy. It's quite extraordinary that the government closed our economy, made it essentially illegal to go to work, to illegal to gather. And I understand why, right? There was a very real danger of overwhelming our hospital systems. And that was a danger that we simply couldn't risk. And so we took extraordinary and very extreme and draconian measures to prevent that from happening. Congress replied major legislation to deal with the economic fallout, but the human toll goes beyond economics. It's large scale. Um, mandatory isolation, for instance, is particularly problematic for at-risk populations. And that fallout from that is harder to calculate, harder to quantify in some cases. Um, but it includes people living with addiction who, in many cases, lose social connections, they lose their support networks, they're faced with increased fear and anxiety, and that exacerbates their underlying problems. We've heard certainly anecdotally that the COVID lockdowns have prompted a rise in the diseases of despair, uh, alcoholism and, dr and drug abuse generally, and even suicide. This all requires really careful careful monitoring. Um, one additional uh, proactive step we can take is the Improve Addiction Care Act. This is legislation I've introduced with Senator Joe Manchin, and it requires state Medicaid programs to make efforts to connect Medicaid-covered opioid overdose survivors to treatment and ensure that prescribers are alerted to the fact that their Medicaid-covered patients' previous non-fatal opioid overdose uh, has occurred, and hopefully that would inform their judgment about future prescriptions. So a discussion like what we're having today is a forum that helps us to explore the importance of these and other uh, possible reforms. We're going to examine some of the challenges associated with addiction in general and discuss specific actions that can be taken to prevent overdose deaths. That being said, I am uh, honored and grateful that we have with us today the director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Jim Carroll. That title is quite a mouthful. Um, uh, director Carroll is also uh, more simply known as the drug czar. And he and his team have been tremendous advocates for individuals struggling with addiction. They have worked very closely with my office, specifically to help in Pennsylvania this, and, and across the country, I'm sure. But I'm very much aware of their excellent work in Pennsylvania. And I want to thank Director Carroll for his work, for his efforts, and for his time today. And at this point, let me recognize Director Carroll for his opening remarks. Good morning, Senator. And first off, a belated happy birthday. Um, uh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you were able to celebrate um, safely, um, but I hope you were able to at least enjoy a few minutes of birthday cake. Well, I, I will tell you, I celebrate all of my 39th birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it was, um, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to participate in today's sure. webinar. It's a great honor to join you and this distinguished group um, for an important discussion on the Trump administration's response to the opioid epidemic. And we sincerely appreciate the leadership that you have had in Congress and this really is not just a bipartisan issue, it is such a nonpartisan issue, and you have led the way on those efforts. As you mentioned, the disease of addiction has just devastated communities throughout our nation, and sadly, including communities 
in Pennsylvania. And we are hearing from frontline providers from all over the state in Pennsylvania, but sadly across the country, that there has been an increase in the number of fatal overdoses since March of this year. Again, that is consistent with the data that we're getting from around the country. What we know is the increased levels of substance misuse and drug overdoses have likely been fueled by the anxiety and isolation associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the risk of drug use increases greatly during times of transition. And that's certainly what we're facing now with the insecurity that is out there, the anxiety that you mentioned. And also, of course, with the lockdown has come the loss of jobs for so many people. And especially for people who are newly in recovery, the loss of these jobs has created those feelings of not only the isolation that that brings, but also the financial insecurity, the financial instability that really does just wreak havoc with them as they're beginning to take the first new steps. And we know that the imposed limitations on physical proximity to others, the social isolation, the lack of support from peer recovery services, the lack of support from churches that have been so instrumental across the state of Pennsylvania. We know that loneliness has increased. And as a result, many people have either turned to substances as an outlet or begun using them again. So it's more important than ever that we recommit ourselves to preventing drug use, enhancing access to treatment and supporting those in recovery, as well as keeping these dangerous drugs off the streets of our country. President Trump has mobilized the entire government to confront this problem. One way we're drawing that here at ONDCP is coordinating with my colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Department of Veterans Affairs and dozens of other federal, state, local and tribal agencies to coordinate our actions and ensure we're meeting the needs of the American people. ONDCP has taken aggressive action to make sure that those suffering from opioid and substance use disorder are not forgotten amid the pandemic response. Some of the most significant actions include removing the barriers to telehealth. And this is certainly true in Pennsylvania and the work that so many people I think on the panel are very familiar with. Providers on the ground, such as the folks today, are telling us that during the pandemic, they have seen the use of telehealth increase from about 40% to 95%, a big change from pre-COVID to now dealing with COVID. This really helps continue the care that is going on. That continuum of care is so critical for people who are just entering into treatment and recovery. And so it's the telehealth is certainly one of those perhaps silver linings um, that we can look to for COVID to staying with us in the long term. We've also had to push for PPE for treatment centers. In the initial weeks of the pandemic, we were hearing that treatment centers were finding it difficult to obtain PPE as they were not being prioritized in the same way that other clinical or medical facilities were. And so we here at the White House broke the logjam. We issued guidance directly from my office calling for treatment centers to have access to the valuable life-saving PPE at a time when it was in short supply so that treatment could continue, so these treatment centers could remain open and people in recovery were provided with the continuity of care. In June, ONDCP launched the Rural Community Toolbox, which can be found at ruralcommunitytoolbox.org, an online clearinghouse to connect local leaders in rural parts of the country with data, information, even funding opportunities, grants, to be able to address the unique needs of rural America and of course the many beautiful parts of rural Pennsylvania in the fight to help people suffering from substance use disorder. Additionally, of course, under President Trump's leadership, Operation Warp Speed has resulted in the development of promising vaccine candidates against COVID-19. And so while we can see a brighter day in the future with regard to COVID-19, 
illicit drug use, addiction, these consequences were with us before COVID. And unless we continue to take the fight to this, this issue, this is going to persist for many years to come. At such prevention, treatment and recovery, as well as keeping these drugs off our streets are key lines of effort in our national drug control strategy. And research has a critical role in this line of effort. In 2018, the Trump administration through the National Institute of Health launched the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, which is an aggressive non, um, a, an aggressive trans-agency effort to speed scientific solutions to stem the national opioid public health crisis, as it's quoted. Just last year, the initiative invested a billion dollars in research projects across the United States, many of which focus on research to help us understand how we can better treat patients with opioid use disorder. Medicines containing methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, are the three FDA approved medications for people with opioid use disorder. And we know that they were the gold standard for addiction treatment. So even though these medications have robust evidence for their efficacy, there's still opportunities to improve upon them and improve on their formulations. I know Dr. Prone's research at the University of Pennsylvania is going to help us understand if injectable buprenorphine is more effective than the existing sublingual buke. And so I'm anxious to hear any comments from her about that today. It's this type of research, this type of innovation that we need to defeat the disease of addiction and to save American lives. And of course, we do have to continue, con, um, contend with the supply of illicit drugs in our communities. And I wanna recognize your work, Senator Toomey, your leadership on this issue. Your bills that would disrupt the flow of illicit fentanyl from foreign countries and improve access to treatment for those who have experienced a non-fatal opioid reload related overdose, the Blocking Deadly Fentanyl Imports Act and the Improved Addiction Care Act are wonderful bills. These are life-saving bills. I'm proud to say that I support both of these bills I su and the administration supports the intent of both of these bills. And my staff has been working hand in hand with your staff and the leadership that you have demonstrated on this to make sure that we can make uh, keep these deadly fentanyl imports um, away from our streets. So Senator Toomey, thank you for your strong leadership on the opioid crisis. Um, we certainly need more members like you out there fighting. I'll, I'll tell you, Senator, when the President Trump nominated me to be the director here, his advice to me as I walked out of the Oval Office that day was to be relentless. Those two words have defined my strategic vision for my work here and what I've charged our staff to do. What we have done under that relentless campaign is providing critical funding through our drug-free communities program, which helps prevent drug use among our nation's youth. This year, we're supporting 15 drug-free community coalitions, um, about $1.8 million across the state of Pennsylvania alone and we're not done. We're in the process right now of awarding this year's grants. We've already announced an, another 11 DFCs, Drug-Free Community Coalitions across the state, and there's more that are going to be named at the beginning of December. This DFC program has accounted for significant reductions in youth substance use. In communities with a DFC program, alcohol has declined by 27% and prescription drugs have declined by 24% alone. We also fund the high intensity drug trafficking area program. Thanks to your support, Senator Toomey, for this important HIDA program. It's keeping illegal drugs off the streets. This year for Pennsylvania, we have supported 11 counties, areas within Pennsylvania with $12 million to combat the drug trafficking just in the streets and the cities and towns of Pennsylvania. So the progress that we have made in the fight against addiction is only possible because of the re relentless commitment of stakeholders like the people on the phone and people listening today. We have more naloxone that is available, over 400% increase in the availability of naloxone. We have drug 
deactivation and at-home disposal more prominent than others to make sure that these pills aren't being diverted out into the streets. We're making sure that take-home medications as well um, have been increased during this. And so whether you're a speaker today, a listener today, everyone being here today joining Senator Toomey is working hard to save lives. And so I sincerely appreciate um, allowing me to be on. And Senator Toomey, I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much, Director Carroll. Thanks for your, uh, your thoughts this morning, for joining us, for the work that you've done. And just for the record, I do want to uh, inform people. Uh, my legislation, which I think is very important, uh, has met with some resistance, uh, but uh, Director Carroll has been a consistent, outspoken advocate at the White House, and uh, his support has made a big difference in getting us as far as we are. So uh, for all, among all the many things that you have done and continue to do, Director Carroll, I'm grateful for that particular uh, aspect of your work. Um, I'm going to um, introduce uh, our three panelists now. I'm going to keep the introductions very, very brief. I hope nobody minds that. And then after I've introduced all three, I'll go back and recognize the uh, panelists one after another for brief opening remarks. And then um, the Q&A portion will uh, fill out the balance of the program. So the, the first of the speakers that I'm going to introduce is Sergeant David Kennedy, who is the president of the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association. Uh, Sergeant Kennedy has a long and distinguished career with the Pennsylvania State Troopers, and uh, he has done terrific work and can uh, give us a, a briefing on the impact that the opioid crisis has had here in Pennsylvania and specifically how the troopers are working and continue to work to combat this pandemic. Uh, so Sergeant Kennedy, thank you for joining us. We have Dr. Jean-Marie Perrone. Uh, Dr. Perrone is the emergency medicine physician at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the founding director of the Penn Medicine Center for Addiction Medicine and Policy and the medical director at the Center for Opioid Recovery and Engagement. Dr. Perrone will discuss with us some of the challenges that patients with addiction face and ways that we can improve care for people suffering from addiction. And then finally, we have uh, Julia Donahue, PhD professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of Pittsburgh. She's also the director of the Medicaid Research Center and the co-director of the Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Prescribing. And Dr. Donahue will speak on her own research findings that point to non-fatal overdoses as a potential precursor for fatal overdoses. And that's uh, obviously very, very important. So uh, let me now uh, begin. Sergeant Kennedy, you are recognized for your uh, opening comments. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Good morning. As the Senator said, my name is David Kennedy. I currently serve as the president of the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association. I am a sergeant in the Pennsylvania State Police. My last duty assignment was as the supervisor for the firearms unit at the Academy, which is in Hershey, PA. I'm released from duty so that I may uh, represent the men and women of the Pennsylvania State Police. It is my honor and privilege to represent the nearly 4,500 uh, men and women who are troopers here in Pennsylvania. I also represent over 5,000 retirees, their families and dependents. The Pennsylvania State Police was created by an act of legislature which was signed into law by Governor Samuel W. Pennypacker on May 2nd, 1905. It was the first uniform police organization of its kind in the United States. The Pennsylvania State Police provides full-time police coverage to 1,298 municipalities, 50.49% of the entire Commonwealth. In addition, PSP covers nearly 73% of the total land mass of Pennsylvania and 21% of the total population. Pennsylvania State Police is a full service organization that provides a variety of police resources and solutions. The Patrol Unit, Criminal Investigation Unit, and the Forensic Unit are just a few of the many services our members offer to the community and to other police agencies. Pennsylvania has been hit hard by the opioid crisis. Both prescription opioids and heroin overdoses are the number one public health crisis in Pennsylvania today. Arrests for the possession of opium, 
uh, heroin and fentanyl increased from 1,846 in 2018 to 2,436 in 2019. Year to date in 2020, there have been 1,830 arrests. Factor in the cost of thefts, burglaries, and the suffering of families, and you understand how serious an issue this has become. There is no area of the Commonwealth that has not been touched by this scourge. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has the ability to track overdose incidents and overdose deaths via ODIN catalog. The Overdose Info Information Network, which is ODIN, is compiled and, con and collated by the Office of the Attorney General. A cursory check of calendar year 2019 indicates that reporting agencies documented 4,288 overdoses and 692 deaths in calendar year 2019. Thus far in 2020, there have been 4,467 overdoses and 705 deaths, a significant increase in that there are two months left in calendar year 2020. In just the third quarter of 2020, the Pennsylvania State Police report seizing nearly 20 pounds of heroin and 13 pounds of fentanyl. It's an issue that hits close to home here at the PSTA. Just this past year, a member, a member of our executive board suffered an exposure to fentanyl while serving a search warrant. Thankfully, he was treated without further incident. Our troopers worked tirelessly to rid the Commonwealth of this poison. We are proud to partner with Senator Toomey to bring this conversation to the public. We thank Senator Toomey for being at the forefront of this effort. We sent a letter of support in September of 2018 in the Blocking Deadly Fentanyl Imports Act. The men and women of the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association are appreciative of this legislation. The members of the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association stand ready to confront this threat to our communities. We thank Senator Toomey for his efforts to make our Commonwealth and our country safer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeant Kennedy. I appreciate that. Um, next, Dr. Perone, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you uh, for convening this really important discussion to address treatment opportunities to mitigate the lives lost to opioid overdose. I'm a mom and I'm an emergency medicine physician. I have so often had to call the mothers and fathers of a young person lost to opioid overdose in my emergency department. What I see in those families is the tragic ending of struggles that the family endured in trying to address the illness of their son or daughter. They face dead ends, stigma, anger, and devastating sadness as that journey ends with only more questions and guilt. What could they have done differently? Was there a better doctor or program that they didn't know about? I have also had the gratifying experience of watching people in recovery lead patients from my emergency department into care by sharing their journey of recovery and guiding my vulnerable patients to the next steps with medications and follow-up care. Our program in the Penn Medicine Emergency Department is a peer-led model, meaning we take patients, people in recovery and help guide patients into their first treatment steps. We've engaged hundreds of patients with a start on medications and a bridge to follow-up care. During the pandemic, we rapidly shifted to provide these services virtually through telehealth and continue that warm line to provide low barrier access to care for patients who are seeking treatment. In the past two years, there have been over 29,000 visits to emergency departments in Pennsylvania for non-fatal opioid overdose. These are the survivors. In that time, we've also lost 4,000 Pennsylvanians per year, more than 8,000 people, sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers who could have been receiving evidence-based care. Opioid use disorder is a treatable chronic, dis chronic disease like diabetes and hypertension. We need to change the stigma and privacy laws around addiction care that make it so difficult to access and discuss. The Improving Medicaid Program's response to overdose victims and Enhancing Addiction Care Act would allow current funding strategies and state Medicaid programs to enhance communication between doctors and their patients, including those who have experienced a non-fatal opioid related overdose. This summer, I cared for a woman in my emergency department who was brought by ambulance after an overdose. She'd been fortunately revived by bystander Narcan. She was not sure what happened, just that she had reported taking extra steps of her prescribed pain medicine. I was able to look her up in our Pennsylvania PDMP and find her prescriber, who was a physician in our health system, unaware of this extra use of opioids. 
I sent her a confidential internal email and she was able to offer the patient an informed decision about risky medication use and the patient opted for treatment with medications for opioid use disorder, specifically buprenorphine. These communications are surprisingly infrequent due to barriers and privacy and the complexity of the electronic health record. One study showed that when doctors were made aware of the overdose outcomes of some of their patients, they were able to prescribe opioids more judiciously and at lower doses to mitigate the risk of future overdose. In parallel efforts at Penn Medicine, we use enhanced decision support tools to integrate a risk assessment of a patient based on their prior medical records to ensure that we are providing short-term low-risk prescriptions to mitigate the risk of initiating long-term use. We are also using reminders and nudges to enhance the co-prescribing of naloxone with many opioid prescriptions to make sure this life-saving antidote is on hand. We urgently need enhanced focus on solutions. We hope that this critical public health issue, which has been escalating with the COVID-19 epidemic, can be addressed with bipartisan support in Congress. Help us bring recovery to the patients and families who are struggling in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and around the country. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Perrone. Uh, now, Dr. Donahue, you're recognized. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Toomey, for the invitation to join this important discussion. Uh, my name is Julie Donahue. I'm a professor of public health at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I'll just briefly add to the excellent points that have been made by the other panelists. Um, and I want to touch on some of the issues of fragmentation that Dr. Perrone mentioned. Uh, the, the U.S. healthcare system is characterized by fragmentation. Uh, we have multiple payers, uh, multiple health systems uh, delivering healthcare, uh, each with its own data system. And this fragmentation has really complicated efforts to address the opioid crisis, um, hampering efforts to prevent and treat opioid addiction. One of the most vulnerable high-risk groups to target for intervention for uh, reducing overdose death um, are individuals who've already experienced a non-fatal overdose. Um, many overdoses are in fact treated in healthcare settings uh, during an emergency department visit or an inpatient stay. And these encounters, these touches with the healthcare system create a window of opportunity to um, address opioid prescribing and to engage patients with addiction treatment. To shed light on the extent to which health systems were really capitalizing on these windows of opportunity, my colleagues and I at the University of Pittsburgh examined the experience of over 13,000 Medicaid enrollees in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania who were treated in healthcare settings for either a heroin overdose or a prescription opioid overdose um, in a study published in JAMA. And we looked for changes in prescription opioid prescribing and medication assisted treatment with buprenorphine, naltrexone or methadone from the six months before the non-fatal overdose to the six months after the non-fatal overdose to see what had changed. And what we found was that the likelihood of filling at least one opioid prescription only decreased by a little bit after the non-fatal overdose by about three and a half percentage points for those experiencing a heroin overdose and by about six and a half percentage points for those experiencing a prescription opioid overdose. On the treatment side, the marginal improvement after this life-threatening event was also small. So medication assisted treatment rates uh, increased for heroin overdose survivors by three and a half percentage points and by only one and a half percentage points for those with a prescription opioid overdose. Looking at the data another way, patients were about four times more likely after surviving an opioid overdose to fill another opioid prescription than they were to receive treatment for their addiction. Um, in other words, we, we found a relatively weak health system response. Uh, and while these findings were disappointing, they were not really a big surprise because we know about the barriers to information sharing on risk factors for overdose. These are not unique to Medicaid enrollees or to the Medicaid system. In fact, these are global problems that affect privately insured patients uh, as well. The legislation introduced by Senator Toomey would help to address these important information gaps by connecting Medicaid enrollees who experience a non-fatal overdose to treatment, ensuring that prescribers are alerted when their patients suffer an overdose. 
Uh, this information could inform both pain treatment decisions and addiction treatment decisions. Um, and these steps will help to address uh, the important system fragmentation that gets in the way of responding to this complex public health crisis. Thank you. Um, Dr. Donahue, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks to all of our uh, panelists. Let me begin with a series of questions and then um, I will turn it over to Dr. Carroll for his questions. Um, let me start with um, Sergeant Kennedy and um, I just want to make sure that we're all clear on this. I, I think uh, it came through in your testimony, but I, I want people to understand um, what I understood you to say in your testimony to mean is that we had a period of time when we seemed to be making progress in the form of fewer overdose deaths, fewer uh, opioid overdoses in general, certainly in Pennsylvania. Uh, that seemed to be the case in 2018 and 2019. But it appears that now here in 2020, that progress has been lost. We've reversed. And in fact, in 2020, we're on track. In fact, we're certainly going to have a worse year than we had in 2019. I don't know if it'll be even worse than 2018. But, but is that correct, that we were making progress on this, but that this year things have moved backwards? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, so that's very disturbing, obviously, uh, that, that something as serious as this that, that results in so many fatalities and so much human suffering after making progress to see that momentum lost and going in the opposite direction tells me that we've all got to redouble our efforts. We're, we're in a very, very difficult environment. Let me ask you a question, um, Sergeant Kennedy, if you, if, you, if you know the answer to this. What is your impression of where most of the deadly illicit fentanyl uh, on Pennsylvania's, in Pennsylvania's communities, where does it come from? Uh, Senator, it, it comes from a variety of locations, uh, mostly through our port cities. Um, but again, it could be anywhere. Com the Commonwealth is such a, a large place. Uh, we're bordered by... Um, New York, Ohio, Delaware, right, and uh, Maryland, so and and New Jersey. So it's uh, it could come in from any one of those states. They're all big ports, right? Uh, I just want to follow up because you you allude to ports, and um, I, I guess what I'm thinking is that while the actual precise route into Pennsylvania is extremely varied, ultimately it's coming in from overseas. Isn't isn't that the case? That's correct. So, so that's what I'm getting at. Yes. To, to your knowledge, there's not a domestic fentanyl manufacturing industry that is really supplying the majority of the fentanyl that is killing people on our streets. That's correct, sir. And so to the extent that it is coming from overseas, um, it seems to me that's a pretty strong argument for doing all that we can to try to stop it at its source. And, um, and that's why my legislation is about creating a penalty for a foreign government that is not doing all that it can. You know, in most countries, it's it's nominally illegal to produce and export illicit fentanyl, but the extent to which the governments are enforcing that law can vary quite a lot. Um, are, are there any other uh, major directions you think we should go legislatively um, that, that can help uh, either in limiting the supply or, or otherwise for, um, for uh, the job that you and your colleagues have to do? I think anything we can do to prevent the, the import of these narcotics is paramount to what we need to do. Um, the, the difficult part, especially with fentanyl, and the, the two doctors could speak to this a lot better than I can, um, is when they mix it with other drugs, uh, which causes a, a significant problem because once, a, say, a heroin user uses fentanyl one time, they nearly overdose. It's like a network of uh, drug addicts will go to that particular dealer because they know that they have that particular drug, which causes the rise and the spike in the overdoses as well as the deaths. Um, so anything we could do to prevent the import of this uh, narcotic, and if we could start 
looking towards prosecuting these individuals who um, concoct these cocktails of heroin and fentanyl, which ultimately causes the death of individuals. We have a pretty robust law in Pennsylvania, which is uh, drug delivery was uh, resulting in death. However, it's very, they are very difficult cases to prove. Um, but if we could work legislation towards that on a federal level, especially for the importers of the, the fentanyl, I think that that would be extremely helpful to our men and women. And, and Sergeant Kenny, just to be clear about the difficulty of proving these uh, 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 cases, it, 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 my understanding is that, that it's often because there are multiple uh, drugs and, and poisons and toxins in a person's system. And under our law, it can be very difficult to prove that one in particular caused the fatality. And, and that makes it more difficult to get a conviction against the people that are supplying these drugs. Is that right? Absolutely correct, sir. Absolutely correct. Okay. Um, let, me, uh, let me go to Dr. Prone. Thank you very much, uh, Sergeant Kennedy. Um, Dr. Perone, you know, one of the things that was um, surprising for me to learn as a layman who um, has no experience in, in medicine, um, and, I'm, and I think this could be surprising to many people, and, and, and that's if I understand this correctly, often a doctor who's prescribing a perfectly legal opioid for a patient if that patient then has an overdose, the doctor who's making the initial prescription in the first place doesn't necessarily have a mechanism to be sure that he or she will even be aware that the patient for whom they provided the prescription just had an overdose. And in fact, the data shows that it's not, it's not all that uncommon for the patient that has had that non-fatal overdose to then get a subsequent prescription without any assurance that there's been some treatment and awareness of what's happened. So did I characterize that accurately? Yes, and I think uh, Dr. Donahue's work actually describes that in great detail. It's, it is the fragmentation of the healthcare system and it is um, you know, the fact that a patient could be treated for an overdose at a different health system um, or right. the same health system um, and still not, not make that to a part of the medical record where the prescribing doctor is going to know that. So that's, that's really important. Um, and I think that the, you know, the opportunity that this legislation might support uh, enhancing that communication um, is, is really very important. One thing we've talked about in the past is putting that information into the prescription drug monitoring program. Um, as another way of disseminating, you know, that risk to the subsequent prescribers. Because um, not just that doctor, but any doctor who would prescribe would want to know that that patient had an overdose. And, and of course, we, you know, the frontline physicians, we need to, to work as much as we can to uh, enable that patient into treatment on that day or in subsequent days by making, you know, engagements in the conversation. But those conversations take a lot of time and and we're busy seeing a lot of patients and, um, right. you know, it's a challenge. Um, you know, some have uh, suggested that they're concerned that our, my, my legislation um, could somehow uh, violate privacy rights of patients. But um, as I think about it, the, the point of this is to simply have the information available to the physician for the patient. Um, that's, not something that we normally think we have to keep a secret from the doctor who's actually prescribing the opioids. Could you just comment on whether you see a privacy problem with this legislation? I think, you know, the, the intention of a lot of the mental health and substance use privacy is well intended, but it yeah. does become more of an obstruction to the continuity of care and the concept that I should have a, a good sense of a patient in treatment or what their mental health issues or what their you know substance use treatment has been. Methadone alone is a is a medication that I can't uh, I can't see whether or not a patient is currently in treatment with methadone, and that's an additional um, both you know benefit and and risk of of being in methadone treatment it doesn't show up on their medication list, and I might not be aware of it. So. There are challenges um, for the patients with that privacy, and many patients want their substance use treatment uh, to be held privately, but, um, but it, 
becomes a, a limitation to the clinicians involved. So I think there's a way to, to improve the transparency without hurting the, the patient's privacy directly. And, and, and just, just to be clear, because I think this is a really important point, um, could you comment as, as a, a doctor, a medical professional, person who has spent a tremendous amount of time uh, treating and, and uh, dealing with folks in this, facing these problems, if, if somebody who suffers from even a severe addiction, if they decide they want treatment and they seek treatment and they get the treatment that they need, what are their prospects for recovery? You know, I think that's such a difficult question and answer. And, and I think families that are looking for treatment and looking at treatment centers, you know, logically would ask, what's the survival rate of my cancer? What's the survival rate for my son if I pay $50,000 for treatment? That data is really difficult to, to ascertain. I, I will say that it is a treatable disease. Initiation onto treatment with buprenorphine is life-saving and doubles the rate of success in treatment. But you know, it is a challenge for patients to stay engaged. Um, certain tools can be helpful. Using recovery specialists and um, medication is critical to the treatment of opioid use disorder. But you know, everybody's journey is a little bit of a wiggly line, not rather than a, a straight trajectory to recovery. Well, thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Donahue. Um, I, you know, is it, your research, your extensive research into the prescribing of opioids to high-risk Medicaid beneficiaries was a big part of the inspiration for this legislation. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I want to make sure I understood something clearly that I, I think you said in your testimony, if I got it right, um, people who suffer from a non-fatal overdose in one, at least one of your studies were four times more likely to get another opioid prescription as they were likely to uh, participate in a treatment program. Did I get that right? That's correct. They were, they were four times more likely to fill an opioid analgesic prescription following a prescription drug overdose than they were to engage in treatment with methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. And are, are those the standards of care for people who, are, uh, who have suffered a non-fatal overdose? No, ideally we would uh, reduce uh, exposure to prescription opioids and increase engagement and treatment following that uh, life-threatening event. And what, what universe of people were you, were you looking at? Did this study include, was this just Medicaid beneficiaries or, or was it another category? So this particular study was Medicaid enrollees only. Um, a, a nearly identical study had been conducted prior to ours uh, by researchers at Harvard, and they studied uh, private insurance data and actually found even greater rates of prescription opioid use following non-fatal overdoses. So I think this is, a, this is a generic health system problem that doesn't really have anything to do with who's paying for the opioid or treatment. Well, I, I hope we, we uh, are making a little bit of progress on the Medicare side, in part because we were able to successfully get the legislation passed that uh, requires the beneficiaries within the Medicare program to identify individuals who have suffered from a non-fatal overdose. So now we're trying to do this within Medicaid. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, given your familiarity with this program, are you confident that the nature of the administration of the Medicaid program in the various states is such that this can be implemented, this can be managed, this is something that uh, they can do. I am confident. And in fact, I think many Medicaid programs are already monitoring their data um, and generating internal opioid dashboards that track things like emergency department visits for opioid use disorder, emergency department visits and hospitalizations for overdose. So the, the data capabilities are there. Um, and I think part of that is due to uh, improvements in reporting of managed care organization uh, encounters to Medicaid agencies. Um, uh, unlike Medicare, where uh, you know, only about a third of Medicare enrollees are in managed care plans, in Medicaid, it's really the dominant system. Right. Um, yeah. So that cooperation and that data reporting is essential. Yeah.
Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me recognize Director Carroll for his questions. Hey, um, thank you, Senator. Um, first off, I want um, in going in the same order, Sergeant Kennedy, the work um, that you have done throughout the state has really been instrumental. And um, we sincerely appreciate the work that you have done in supplying so many members um, of your department to our HIDA teams, led by Jerry Daly and Derek Siegel across the state um, in making sure that there is that combination. The one thing, you know, Sergeant Kennedy, I think I'd follow up on is that we know that almost all of the drugs that are killing folks in Pennsylvania, whether it is fentanyl, as we talked about, or cocaine, or sadly, um, what we're also seeing is appears to be a rise of meth um, in the state and wondered your thoughts about the rise in meth in Pennsylvania and the impact that that's had. Well, sir, that's a great question. Thank you, Director. Uh, meth is extremely powerful drug. It's a cheap drug to make. Uh, it, we're seeing that it's, it's really taking the place of heroin and cocaine, um, and it is highly addictive. It's extremely poisonous, um, and, and it is something that, that we're trying to combat. Yeah. Senator, what we've seen is that all of these drugs um, that are killing us in Pennsylvania and across the country are, are coming in from outside the United States. While there might be some small scale, you know, production of meth um, in, you know, very small quantities, it, it's coming from Mexico in almost 100 percent pure these days. Um, and so it's really been the great work of law enforcement. Um, combating that. And of course, the same is true for fentanyl. Um, you know, the it's coming mainly in these days from Mexico. Um, but the source countries, you know, re continue to remain China and some of the other countries that are involved in this. Um, Sergeant, thank you for all of the work that you're doing across the state um, on all of these dangerous drugs and the dangers um, that your um, men and women are facing. Um, Dr. Perone, um, I really would um, appreciate getting some guidance from you and your thoughts. One of the things that you know we know is that when someone is brought to an emergency department as a result of an overdose, that they are not able to get you know any sort of long term you know I'll say just you know long term meaning you know a week to two weeks worth of buprenorphine to sort of help them until they can get to a treatment provider. I mean, what are your thoughts and you think, you know, of most, you know, of physicians in an emergency department about the ability to prescribe the initial doses of buprenorphine until they can get that warm handoff um, to a provider? Yeah, that's a really important question, Director Carroll. Thank you for letting me comment on that. Uh, buprenorphine is a life-saving medication, but in order to be able to write a prescription for it, one has to take an eight-hour uh, educational course if you're a physician or 24 hours if you're an advanced practice provider like a nurse practitioner. That's a pretty big commitment on top of uh, all of the other efforts that we make. And the average emergency physician may see uh, one or two overdoses a week, but they may not necessarily feel that this training is necessary for them to in engage patients into treatment and start those prescription. So uh, getting rid of that requirement would greatly enhance the ability for uh, all kinds of clinicians to uh, really see opioid use disorder as a disease that we should all be treating in primary care, in OB, in family medicine, and in the emergency department. But that um, special training really adds to a, an extra layer um, that prevents all clinicians from taking on that, that ability. So that's the major barrier for engaging in treatment from the emergency department. And, and it's really something because we don't need that um, additional hours of education on prescribing opioids. Um, That's right. The, and, and so getting help to people is something, you know, that is so critical. And it's something that you all, you know, are right there on the front lines, you know, of doing. Yeah. Um, a, a question for Dr. Donahue. You know, one thing that it seems that we're continually combating is stigma. Um, and whether it's, you know, from their own family, sadly, or even in the community, um, meaning employers, neighbors, um, about recognizing that this is a disease, that it is, and that is not new, right? We've known that addiction is a disease for quite some time, but there's still barriers to overcome 
in, in terms of uh, making people realize that they can raise their hand and say, I need help, just like we can for other diseases. Um, Dr. Donahue, what, I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of strides um, that we continue to make, um, need to make in order to reduce stigma? Thank you, uh, Director Carroll, for that incredibly important question. I think it is, um, it's probably the number one barrier to uh, people seeking treatment. Um, both stigma about the disease of addiction itself, as well as stigma about treatment um, that unfortunately is sometimes held by the healthcare professionals themselves, um, that, that maybe they believe that um, medication treatment is replacing one kind of addiction with another, which is really a very stigmatized view. Um, and I, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of normalizing uh, this, uh, this illness uh, that is, is really uh, affecting people in the prime of their life um, and is, is not a result of personal feeling or um, uh, it's not a moral issue. It's really a medical issue. It's a public health issue and we need to treat it that way. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And, you know, when looking at Sergeant Kennedy and men and women of law enforcement, I think that they're usually the first ones to, you know, to sort of pound the table and say, arresting someone who has an addiction is not the solution. Um, we've learned through law enforcement, um, the, you know, that just putting them through 24 hours of going to jail or 48 hours of going to jail for an addiction really does not do anything for them. And so there's a big distinction um, that's being drawn in Pennsylvania and thankfully in most other states between recognizing that people who have an addiction um, need help and that we need to reserve our jail cells for those who don't have an addiction to a drug, but an addiction to their back pocket, to their wallet, an addiction to greed. Those are the people that Sergeant Kennedy and his men and women, as well as the federal and local folks that he works with, those are the folks that we need um, to send to um, incarceration who are just you know preying on these people that have a disease but the, you know the person who is suffering those are the people where we have and Pennsylvania has been leading the way really on drug courts um, and Senator Toomey thank you for your support of drug courts throughout the Commonwealth and making sure that people who do have an addiction are not incarcerated um, and treated you know in a sort of warehouse situation instead they're getting help from a support community of judges law enforcement probation officers the health department recognizing the needs of these individuals and so um that's been great work that you've been able to do in pennsylvania so thank you senator great um well uh director carroll thank you very much for participating for all the work that you do sergeant kennedy dr perone dr donahue thank you each for the uh, invaluable work that you do. Thank you for taking time out this morning. Um, I, I would just want to encourage everybody, if there's more that you think we can and should be doing on the legislative front, uh, then um, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. This has been a, an ongoing uh, journey for those of us who have been um, trying to understand and come up with public policies that will help uh, diminish uh, this scourge. Um, I think we've made some progress. We've talked about some of the progress we've made, but clearly we've got a very, very long way to go. So um, Director Carroll, did you have any uh, closing remarks you wanted to make? Um, one closing remark um, and then one gift. Um, so as a closing remark, thank you all for participating um, and answering my questions as well as Senator Toomey's. It's been very educational for me. Um, one gift, not just to you, Senator, um, but to everyone, um, is if you allow me to get up, I'm going to, um, Sergeant Kennedy, I'm sure you're, you're used to the challenge points. Um, and so um, to Senator Toomey, is a belated birthday gift, um, but also for all the work that you have done and for everyone on the team, uh, I'm going to be sending up to your office today, Senator, um, as well as sending everyone um, a coin and the, our challenge coin here, and it's the work that everyone on the phone does, um, it's the, our one voice coin. And it's for those who suffer, who haven't gotten help, um, for those in recovery and for those that we have lost. And so we'll be sending that um, out to everyone today. 
Um, and so we sincerely appreciate the work that you've done. Um, this is our unique challenge coin here and certainly all of you um, deserve it. And so thank you, Senator, for allowing me to join. Well, that's very kind. Thank you, Director Carroll. Thanks to all the participants. And this will uh, finish 